to order. Uh, today's hearing, um, I would like to thank, first of all, at the outset, our witnesses for sharing their expertise and views. What I believe is a very, very important and timely hearing following a week in which the U.S. Department of State designated Nigeria a country of particular concern, or CPC country, and also when the chief prosecutor for the International Criminal Court, Fatou Bensouda, announced that a well-founded basis exists for investigating Nigeria for crimes against humanity and war crimes, including investigating both terror organizations such as Boko Haram and the Nigerian security forces. I would note that the focus that the Lantos Commission has had over the years uh, with numerous hearings and briefings on Nigeria and that I have had as chairman of the past chairman of the um, House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Africa, Global Health, Global Human Rights. Uh, I now serve as its ranking member uh, and co-chairman of this commission. Uh, we have focused on Nigeria for a very, very long time, and many of us have traveled there, uh, met with uh, survivors of the Chibok girls' uh, uh, abduction, uh, some family members, as well as some of the young women, uh, and have pressed the case of human rights uh, especially as it relates to terror organizations uh, for many years. And it's been a, both sides of the aisle have been very focused on this, as it ought to be, and the executive branch. The United States and the international community, I believe, must do more to mitigate the violence because, above all, the dire situation on the ground warrants it. The killings, the kidnappings, and sexual abuse is absolutely unconscionable. We should do more because the people of Nigeria deserve to live in peace and freedom with their fundamental human rights guaranteed and protected. And because Nigeria is the largest country in Africa, and what happens there has an outsized impact on West Africa and in Africa as a whole. Nigeria is so large, its population is forecast by some to reach over 400 million by 2050, overtaking the United States as the world's third most populous country. And its economic and political leadership in sub-Saharan Africa is so impactful that we simply cannot ignore it. A stable and prosperous Nigeria contributes to stable and prosperous neighbors. Conversely, an unstable Nigeria, racked by poverty and violence, does not contribute to the well-being of its neighbors, but rather can lead to their destabilization in turn. I shared a hearing on Nigeria almost two years ago uh, to this day, noting that Nigeria was at a crossroads at that time. Today we see escalating violence along ethnic and religious lines exacerbated by economic, social, and political tensions. It is getting worse. Among the seven Nigerian hearings that I previously chaired were a series of hearings that with, re with respect to the designation of Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization, or FTO, along with the bipartisan bill which I introduced, H.R. 3209, uh, that would have called for that designation. While it may sound surprising to some today, for the historical record, it must be stated that the designation of Boko Haram as a foreign terrorist organization was strenuously opposed by the State Department at that time, then led by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Assistant Secretary for Africa Johnny Carson. At one of my hearings in 2012, July 10th to be exact, I asked the Secretary why the Obama administration refused to designate Boko Haram as an FTO, foreign terrorist terrorist organization, and he said, quote, it's an important question. We have indeed designated three individuals who we think are in top leadership positions to that list, but we have not designated the entire organization because we do not believe that Boko Haram is a homogeneous organization. We believe that the larger element of Boko Haram is not interested in doing anything but attempting to discredit, disgrace the Nigerian government. The refusal to designate Boko Haram and FTO went on for about three years. This, however, changed when John Kerry became Secretary of State and Linda Thomas-Greenfeld became the Assistant Secretary for Africa. In fact, it was at a November 3, 2013 hearing that I chaired that Linda Thomas-Greenfeld publicly announced that Boko Haram would be designated a foreign uh, terrorist organization. It was right before we were going to mark up the bill. So today, thankfully, there is a widespread recognition that Boko Haram, along with its breakaway and perhaps more now more powerful faction, the Islamic State West Africa, is clearly a terror threat. But today's hearing will address a related but not as clearly understood phenomenon, which is the violence, mass killings, and atrocities in the middle belt of Nigeria. 
that is a correlate to the violence perpetrated by Boko Haram and others. These acts of horrific violence, which we will hear testimony about, are committed in large part by Fulani militants. And I want to underscore that it's important that we do name those responsible for the violence, that it's ethno-religious component, because there has been a lot of moral equivocation on this point, including by the State Department. Yet the situation has some degree of complexity. Yes, there are tensions between farmers and pastoralists exacerbated by climate change. There are counter-reprisals committed against members of the Fulani community, although they are relatively rare, including those who are innocent of any wrongdoing. But that does not negate the fact that the largest dominant driver of conflict in the Middle Belt region is committed by Fulani extremists who appear driven in large part by ethno-religious chauvinism against mostly Christian farmers, though I do, not, do, I do note that there are elsewhere Shia Muslims who are also victims and that intra uh, Sunni conflicts also exist within the Muslim community as well. Nigerian Bishop William Avenya will testify today that, and I quote in part, the mass slaughter of Christians in Nigeria's Middle Belt by every standard meets the criteria for a calculated genocide from the definition of the Genocide Convention. And yet he notes, and I quote him again, no one has ever been arrested or questioned, or prosecuted, or convicted of any charge related to this spree of killings, which has been going on for at least five years. In its November 18, 2020 report to the International Criminal Court, the Jubilee Campaign writes, and I quote in pertinent part, violence that has taken place in Nigeria's middle belt is spiraling out of control, costing the lives of thousands of civilians and destabilizing the country and region. The violence is often characterized as a, quote, intercommunal conflict between herders and farmers over natural resources. However, the well-worn label is now obsolete due to the increasing asymmetry in attacks, as well as the steadily increasing frequency and organizational planning of Fulani militant attacks against civilian targets. It's worth noting that what separates this situation from that of Boko Haram and the Islamic State, West Africa, is the fact that the Nigerian government under President Buhari is dominated by the Fulani. This is true of the military and the state security forces, but increasingly other institutions of power as well, including the Supreme Court of Nigeria, where Buhari engineered the ouster of Chief Justice Walter Onengen. We now have, we have also seen the sidelining of members of the Fulani community who have demonstrated a commitment to peace, including the ouster of the Emir of Kano in March of this year, at a time when the COVID epidemic was becoming the focus of our attention and all eyes were off that situation. While there is now a consensus that Boko Haram is engaged in terrorism, that consensus breaks down when the issue of Fulani extremism comes up, a topic I hope we will explore today and gain a better understanding of. I'm also concerned about the apparent inability, or perhaps even reluctance, of the Nigerian federal government under President Buhari to stop the violence in the Middle Belt, or even at times to unequivocally condemn the attacks. As I have said before, it's critically important that Fulani political leaders such as President Buhari, Fulani leaders, religious leaders such as the Sultan of Sokoto, and Fulani institutions such as the Cattlemen's Association, all of whom have authority and influence among the Fulani militants, unequivocally condemn these attacks and use their power and influence to promote peace and to promote reconciliation. It is not sufficient that such condemnation be issued in English as well. Rather, they must be in, articulated in Hwasi and Fulfulai. Again, I want to thank uh, my colleagues who will be joining us today, uh, and I would like to yield. Um, we do have some members who are here and some who are here uh, virtually who might want to make uh, opening comments. So, uh, Mr. McGovern, Co-Chair McGovern, are you? Thank you. Thank you very well, much. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And I want to I join my colleague uh, and Co-Chair Chris Smith in welcoming the witnesses uh, and the public to this uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing on the deteriorating human rights situation in Nigeria uh, with a focus on the Middle Belt. 
I understand uh, that there are other members of uh, the commission who will be joining us or who may submit written statements for the record. I appreciate their participation and I look forward to what they will have to say. Uh, Ambassador Brownback, uh, uh, it's good to see you again and I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank you for your work as, um, as ambassador at large for international religious freedom. I know that you have spoken out on behalf of members of many faiths, including Uyghur and other Turkic Muslims and Tibetan Buddhists in China uh, and Rohingya uh, Muslims in Burma. Uh, as a practicing Catholic, I, I benefit greatly from the freedom of re religion that we have historically enjoyed here in the United States. I am also deeply aware that unless and until freedom of